So for the people that can't make it tonight. So uh, my trip to the Galapagos Islands. Um, and this trip I took in 2016. So this was five years ago. So um, refreshing my memory on this trip was I was trying to kind of going down memory lane a little bit in my brain. Um, but yeah, I'll share my experience. So first thing right off the bat, going to the Galapagos Islands is really expensive. So um, just getting there, being there um, is very expensive. So I actually went with a high school group. And um, this woman down at the bottom is Lynn O'Donnell and she teaches biology at uh, Lake Region High School. So she invited me to go along and it was still very expensive, but I was able to, to get out there and, and go into the Galapagos Islands. It's just such a, um, it's such a, a special place for a lot of different reasons, like historically, ecologically, culturally. Um, it's a, it's a very unique place. And it also has this really amazing um, history as far as the natural sciences go. So it was amazing that they invited me to go along. And um, with all of these teenagers, wonderful, wonderful kids. It was really nice. Uh, so this uh, location, this is not on the Galapagos, this is um, on mainland Ecuador, and it's known as the middle of the world. Um, so it's right, it's right on the equator and is kind of the, the middle of the world. <gasps> Sorry, my dog is barking. So traveling to the Galapagos Islands. So we start out on mainland Ecuador. You can't take a large plane into the Galapagos. It just doesn't um, work. So uh, they don't have a, an airport that's big enough for a normal size plane. So traveling there, we took a small plane. So this is, I love taking pictures out of plane windows. So this is um, leaving mainland Ecuador. It's a super mountainous country. Um, so we flew out of Quito. And um, so this is us flying over the mountains in Ecuador. And sorry, one second. Okay. Sorry, everybody. Okay. So the Galapagos Islands are almost 800 miles off of the coast of Ecuador. So they're extremely isolated. Um, they are volcanic islands. So they were formed by volcanoes and, um, and they're awesome. <laughs> so also from the plane, um, the first Galapagos Island, but it's more like a Galapagos rock. So there are over a hundred small islands islets and rocks that are associated with this archipelago. Um, so that's just like the first land piece that I saw out of the plane. So I was very excited, but it is not, um, there's only four inhabited Galapagos Islands that have like towns and roads and things like that. So, um, but anyway, it's still exciting because that was the first one. So we landed on Baltra Island. So you can see this little tiny red circle. Um, it is basically just an airport. It's like just the runway. That's the whole island. Um, so you land at the airport and then drive to the other side of this island to uh, get to the boats to bring you to the, to the larger islands. Um, and on this road, this was the only time I saw a um, terrestrial iguana. Um, and apparently they're not very easy to see. So this was really exciting because it was just walking in the road. So the bus driver was nice enough to stop and let me take a picture of it. And I will say, I love all these kids, but none of them had a proper camera, which was astounding to me. And those of you that, that did come to my Ecuador presentation, um, my photography skills and equipment have come a long way since this Galapagos trip. So, but still, I still had a proper like real camera with me and it was amazing to me how many people didn't have the, 
have the gear. So um, here's my terrestrial iguana. So we went from Baltra, we took a tiny little boat to Santa Cruz. So Santa Cruz is a larger island and it's one of the ones that has um, habitants. I think there's about 30,000 between all the islands, um, about 30,000 people that live permanently on the Galapagos Islands and, um, and a lot more visitors than that per year. So on the, <laughs> this was so exciting. On the little tiny boat ride from Baltra to Santa Cruz, I saw this guy, blue footed booby. And I was like, okay, we can go home now. I saw that one cool species that you can see on the Galapagos. So um, we didn't turn around, um, but I was very excited to see that. I think there's a, a chat. All right, so blue footed booby, very exciting. Um, thinking maybe I would tell you guys about the um, kind of the lack of biodiversity on the Galapagos Islands. Um, I don't know how many of you know know that, but being volcanic islands, um, there there aren't a lot of species out there and a lot of them are actually invasive and I'll talk a little bit about that um, in a bit. So but seeing some of the um, some of the native species was very exciting. So on the island of Santa Cruz, this I was excited to see this yellow warbler, which is a resident, and because I was like yellow warbler, that doesn't look like our yellow warbler, and it is a similar species. This is ours. This is the one that we have here in Maine. Um, so it's just kind of the reds in a different place. This one the reds on its head, and this one the reds on its chest. But I thought that was kind of neat. So jump up and down for joy, right? Galapagos finch. So I don't know how many people have read the beak of the finch, have um, studied or heard about the about Darwin and his expedition to the Galapagos Islands, but um, very very quick. Um, Darwin, Charles Darwin, went to the Galapagos Islands um, and he observed the flora and fauna that live there. And one of the things he really looked at was the birds. And there were amazing birds like the flightless cormorants and penguins and things like that. And then there were all these little finches. So he ended up collecting specimens, which is a very nice way of saying he killed them. Um, and fortunately labeled his specimens. He brought them back to England and he started looking at them and found that there were all kinds of different beak shapes. So a lot of these birds looked the same, but when he started really measuring them, um, there were all these different beak shapes. Um, and I think there's 13 distinct species um, of Galapagos finch. So, and this was his, um, the beginning of his theory of natural selection um, and which then evolved. Huh? into the theory of evolution. And he determined that um, some, like a lot of the species came from unique islands. So luckily he labeled them. Um, so these ones came from Santa Cruz and these ones came from uh, Isabella. And he noticed that a lot of the islands just had their own finch species. So then he, why is that? And what could have happened to, to separate these species and, and determined that there was probably a common ancestor and they evolved over time. So that was neat. So I was really, really excited to see my first Galapagos finch, even though it was this blurry thing in a parking lot. And um, so I asked my, the guide, you know, we had, we had a guide and I was like, oh, what species is that? I was so, I was just like way into it, so excited, right? And he's like, well, actually, um, a lot of times it's very hard to tell which species it is because a lot of them are so similar. So like the ground finches uh, can often have very similar sizes. So really you have to do what Darwin did and collect specimens, which we weren't gonna do. Um, and then he said, further confusing the issue, uh, 
there are hybrids. So like the medium and the small ground finch will breed and then there's a hybrid. So I was a little bit sad because he couldn't tell me for sure what this bird was. And I, this is, this was my, this is how I felt um, about that. But there, I was able to get at least one definite species, which I'll show you a little bit later. All right, so Santa Cruz, we took a bus across land to the other side, um, to a port on the other side where we caught a boat to Isabella. So on this other side, this was the first time I saw these guys, the Sally Lightfoot crab, which is a fantastic name. And this is an adult. And apparently these are found kind of up and down the West coasts, both South America and North America, but I had never seen them before. I thought this is some weird Galapagos thing, um, but apparently you can see them other places. So this is the adult. And then the juvenile is um, darker, more rock colored. So it camouflages better. Um, and I thought they were amazing. And then before we got on the boat, I saw my first marine iguana and I was so excited. I was like, fight, 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 right? Fight. And they didn't. So these species kind of have the same food source. So like marine iguanas eat algae and moss and plants and um, crabs do the same. I actually read that crabs will eat bugs off of the iguanas. So there you go. So they coexist, they do not fight. And um, it was a little bit disappointing, but also just cool to see them um, together. All right, so from Santa Cruz, we took a ferry ride and this was, I think it was um, about maybe an hour and a half or two hours. And so if you get boat sick, um, just be aware, there's a lot of boating involved when you go to the Galapagos Islands if you want to visit more than one. So we went to Isabella, which is um, the largest island and has all these volcanoes on it. And it was beautiful. I mean, blue water. These are the yachts that people, some, some a couple of people have asked me, oh, did you, did you take a yacht? Like you can rent a yacht and just stay on that instead of staying on the islands and driving around in, in, um, and like staying in little dives, which is what we did. I did not take a yacht, although I would happily do that. So arriving on Isabella, again, I will say again, picture time. Um, this, well, it's, it was almost nighttime too, as far as the quality, but we've got our blue footed booby, which is very exciting, but these things, Galapagos penguins, those were the most exciting things for me because I had never seen a penguin at all in the wild because where would I have seen a penguin in the wild? So this was really neat to see them. Um, and I guess now is as good a time as any to talk about endemic species. And I don't know if folks really know what that means, but an endemic species is something that is unique to that place. Um, so there are certain species like the Galapagos finches, like the Galapagos penguins, which evolved, developed on these islands. So they are unique to these islands, um, which is really neat. So then there's others like the boobies that you can find other places. There's migrants that come back and forth from, from mainland. Um, but these are ones that uh, developed here. So that was neat. And then here's some more of those yachts. Um, so this was kind of, this was our first sleepover. Um, we slept on Isabella for a couple of nights and um, it was really amazing. So the next day, our first full day, um, this is from our little, I'm using the word hotel loosely, um, but this is from our little hotel room where they put blast plastic bags over the, faucets so you don't accidentally drink or use the water for brushing your teeth because that could be bad. Um, and this, that morning, right in that dirt road, 
was the first and only amphibian that I saw on the Galapagos Islands. So that was very exciting. It was covered in sand and wasn't moving. Um, so we saved it and brought it to the to the to a safe spot out of the road. Um, but and this is a species that is found on the Galapagos. And there's not again, there's not a lot of biodiversity, um, but a lot of the animals that are there are very unique. So that was fun. A little, a little bit more about the trip itself, because some of you maybe have heard of this company, EF Tours. Um, this is a, um, a company that really works with young people with high schools, um, sometimes middle schools, to lead trips to unique places. And, um, and I just have to be honest, it wasn't my favorite thing. Um, just for folks that are considering if you have grandkids or kids that are in high school and these EF tours sound really cool and they're totally cool, I will admit, but they're very fast paced. So for me, if I was going by myself, um, I would have slowed down quite a bit, not because I'm lazy or slow physically, um, but I I felt like the trip was designed to just go, go, go and not stop and really observe and take time. And um, a place like the Galapagos Islands that is so special and so significant um, for so many reasons, I, I just felt like, let's just stop and breathe for a second. Let's look at this. Look at this amazing place. So um, I was always, always falling behind, always. So lots of pictures of the group from the back because I was never leading the pack. Um, and I've got a lava flow, a hardened lava flow um, because they are volcanic islands and the volcanoes are still active, um, occasionally spewing a little bit, um, nothing too catastrophic uh, that I'm aware of recently, but um, it's still flowing. Here I am at the back of the pack again. This was, um, we were going through this kind of mangrove swamp on, on Isabella. And it was, it was amazing. There were all these different species and, um, and they were taken right off. They left me in the dust. So my first ever flamingo was on the Galapagos Islands. My first time ever seeing flamingos, which was amazing. And um, black neck stilt which some are, you can find in Maine sometimes. Um, these are species that, again, they migrate or they're found in other places. So people can see them much more easily than on the Galapagos. But then there's the Galapagos pintails. So this is one of those endemic species that at first glance, you might say, those are mallards, um, but they are Galapagos pintails um, and they, so I, I got really excited. The book, the, I have a birds, mammals, and reptiles of the Galapagos Islands book, and um, it's so thin. I'll show you when we're, when, um, when I stop sharing, um, but these are very unique, and for those of you that are birders, we have pintails here in Maine um, called northern pintails, which, I mean, really, look at that pintail. This is, I don't know, it's more of like a, an all than a pin. Anyway, so um, at this point, the group was so far ahead of me that I couldn't see them, so I had to run. Um, lava lizards, people always talk about the finches, but the lava lizards are really awesome as well. Um, so we've got the Galapagos lava li lizard, which all three of these pictures are the Galapagos lava lizard in different stages. Um, but on some of the smaller, more remote islands, which I did not get to, they have these super unique subspecies of the lava lizard. So similar to the finches, you've got all the finches and then on different islands, you've got these subspecies. And, um, and the same, it's the same thing, this kind of evolution over time based on their surroundings and they are uh, unique to those islands. And it's harder for them to like travel to different islands. So there's not 
um, as much risk of that, of the hybridization um, happening. So pretty neat, another endemic species. And on Isabella, um, one of the big exciting things was there is a, a tortoise breeding center. So there are tortoises <clears throat> roaming around, um, but they are in more remote areas, like in the wild. And uh, so really the best way to see a tortoise is at one of these breeding centers or, or a nature center that, that has them. So um, these, this breeding center had just a, a ton of tortoises and people always ask, not people, I will not say that. Kids, whenever I talk to them about going to the Galapagos, every time, did you ride a tortoise? <laughs> no, that is super illegal and very, very wrong. Um, so these animals should not be ridden. And we've probably all seen those historic photos of uh, in the 1800s of, of people riding them. And it's just, it's not, um, it's just not done. Um, that'll get you kicked out of the country, which includes all of Ecuador as well, um, since the Galapagos Islands is part of, part of that country. So don't do it. Don't jump the fence and try and ride a tortoise. Um, so these tortoises, so this is similar to the lava lizards and the finches. There are different subspecies on different islands. So Isabella actually has, I think, four distinct subspecies just on that island. Um, and, you know, they're slow enough and they're just kind of separated by mountains, by volcanoes that they have these very distinct um, different subspecies. So this one is um, Gunthery is really the primary um, uh, name for that. And um, oh, there's five, I'm looking in my book. Um, so it, there's all of these subspecies and you can tell them apart. First of all, size. Um, also there's some, this has a convex, right? Convex shell. Um, but there are some that are kind of concave. They're called saddlebacks. Um, so they don't have that big domed um, shell. And so this is the, for this part of Isabella Island, um, this is the species that is traditionally found in this area. So this is what is happening at this breeding center. So they try to keep, keep that localized. So they're not going to breed a tortoise on Isabella that is usually found on Santa Cruz. Right? So they're trying to, to bring these back and, and bringing us back to the invasive species thing. Goats were introduced um, when the early settlers came and they eat a lot of vegetation, um, which some people really like that. You introduce a goat and it gets rid of all the brush that you don't want. Um, but when they're competing with this large land mammal or land reptile, for um, a food source, it, it just, um, there are so many reasons why these guys almost went extinct and some subspecies actually did go extinct. But um, one of the reasons is competition from invasive species on the islands. And then people just like eating them, um, which doesn't help. <laughs> so I got a video. Oh, yeah. I thought this. You can probably hear me. Make sure you go for the What? What? I thought that was. I thought it was just this slow motion traffic disaster. And right before they hit, um, the one on the right tucks its head in. And I'm like, what are you doing? What are you doing? So in this. Um, video, you can see that the males are larger. So they look very similar, but the males are larger than the females. Um, and that was just kind of a, a funny encounter. And here's some of the smaller ones. So there were, there were tortoises of all different sizes. Um, and so these ones I think were a couple of years old. The adults, they can live, I think in the wild, um, around 100 years. The oldest ever on record was in a zoo and it was 170 years old. Um, one of these Galapagos tortoises. So they are, they're incredible. 
they're incredible. But um, so it's really, it was really nice that they take conservation extremely seriously on these islands. Um, so it was nice to, to see that. And here's somebody with his little head tucked in. So these are all that Gunthery subspecies. Are we having any questions? I feel like there's chatting happening. Nope, there are some, some other folks have traveled to the Galapagos. <gasps> and so um, Steve shared that they went with um, National Geographic tours and then Molly shared that they went with Road Scholar. And so maybe at the end, we could just have some time for them to share their experiences because they both said they were terrific tours. Yes. So. Probably not <clears throat> going with a bunch of teenagers. No, they were great kids, great kids, but um, it certainly is a different experience um, for sure. And here's just a close up of that, of that shell. Um, so the Sierra Negra volcano was difficult. I'm not doing the process of getting up. Um, it was really hard. It was really hard hiking up there. So this is a not quite extinct volcano. It is occasionally active. Um, I think I read the last time it had any kind of um, action was in 2018. Had some some lava flowing out of it. Um, so here's me in the middle. Little story about me. I hate getting sunburned. I hate getting sunburned. So I dressed up a lot. I was totally covered head to foot, sunscreen, the whole deal, the whole time. People gave me a hard time, but one of the girls actually got sun poisoning um, because we're on the equator. The Galapagos is extremely hot, very dry, very, very sunny. Um, so I stand by that decision to um, to totally cover up, but I was so sweaty at the end of this. Um, here's a view of that. Um, totally worth the hike for sure. This was exciting. Um, this guy flew over and landed close by. This is a Galapagos hawk, um, which is an endemic bird of prey. So they've got a couple of owls, which we have in other places, barn owls, short-eared owls. Um, they have osprey occasionally, they've got peregrine falcons occasionally, but the Galapagos hawk is, um, is the only one that is endemic to these islands. Um, for those of you that are birders, it looks kind of like a juvenile eagle. Um, so if I saw that, glance that in my backyard here in Maine, I would probably say, oh, an eagle, um, but it's not. It's a Galapagos hawk. So, and this is a juvenile. They get to be all um, dark when they're adults. Hey, Mary. Yes. We have a question about, do you know how to measure the age of the tortoises? I do not. I'm sure that, does somebody else? Is that why they're asking? I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. It probably has something to do with their carapace and the size and maybe number of scales. I'm not seeing it in my book. It does say that sexual maturity is attained at the age of 20 to 25 years. <clears throat> that seems like maybe human maturity as well. And then um, we have someone else who also went to the Galapagos. So this whole crew is just full of experience. This is amazing. Yes. But Dorothy wanted to let you know that their guides wore large hats, long sleeves, and long pants to protect them from the sun. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Dorothy. There's also a request to go a tiny bit slower on some of the slides, like okay. the eagle in flight. Ah, the hawk does look like an eagle. Yeah, I can go back to that. Um, so one thing that, so the lack of bio, biodiversity was like, oh, I'm not seeing very much, but um, it does make identification unless it's the finches um, for any other thing. Um, it does make identification easier because 
here in Maine, it's like you see something, you're like, well, it could be this or this, especially this time of year with migration. And um, on the Galapagos, it's like, no, there's, there's one hawk. There's a single hawk to choose from. And there it is. And you're not going to get a stray. We are 800 miles from the mainland, right? So that was kind of, kind of a nice thing. Um, plus seeing these endemic species, like knowing that I'm not ever going to see these in another place is, is, I don't know, it was just an amazing experience for a, for a birder. <laughs> Here's a fun story about invasive species um, and my experience with them. So there are no wasps on the Galapagos Islands, naturally. Um, there's carpenter bees um, and there's like a Galapagos carpenter bee, which is friendly and nice and wonderful. And then there's the yellow paper wasp, um, which is invasive and it was first recorded in 1988. And one of them got, this is one of the reasons why you shouldn't wear long pants, got stuck in my pants and stung me. And this, I don't have an especially large leg. This is my thigh. And I ended up not being able to wear pants for a couple of days because of this sting. And um, it got so bad that, that the, our guide actually considered sending me back to the mainland because it was so, I couldn't walk. It was like, it, it was in the muscle. It was just it was just a really terrible experience. So that was very painful, um, but it did end up sus subsiding. I took a lots of Benadryl and, um, you know, these, these islands are inhabited, um, but they're rudimentary, right? So there's, it's not, um, there's not like a huge hospital. So it was uh, disconcerting, but it all worked out. I survived. I'm here. Mary, going back to the hawk, um, yes. do you know if there is any, uh, if there are any natural predators? Oh, excuse me. She's asking, what do they eat? What do they eat? Um, I believe um, they eat small, smaller birds. Um, and by scavenging, so they'll um, they'll eat dead things, and I'm not sure what smaller things they eat because I don't have um, a really good handle on mammals of the Galapagos. But I believe there are some small rodents that live out there. Um, yeah, there's some some rats that um, that are out there naturally again on the different islands. So, yeah, but scavengers too, um, like our eagles, everybody thinks of our eagles as these big majestic things that are, um, but they're often, you know, feeding on dead deer along with the vultures on the side of the road. So, um, so these guys are also scavengers. Ah, I want to relive this. Next. So, um, we spent a couple of days out on Isabella and then we went back to Santa Cruz. Um, but the night before we left, I don't know if anybody remembers this, in 2016, there was a big earthquake right by mainland Ecuador, um, which was devastating. So there were a lot of coastal communities that were um, very hard hit. Um, on mainland. And so the night before we left, we were actually under tsunami warning um, where we were on Isabella. But Isabella is also, it's further away from the mainland. It's, it's, it's kind of blocked by some of the other islands. So it was there and then the tsunami warning was there and then they kind of canceled it. But the next day they were like, oh, should we, shouldn't we go on the boat back to Santa Cruz? Um, it, was, it was kind of rough. And this is on the boat and these waves, again, I didn't have like a, a big zoom lens. I mean, I just had kind of a point and shoot and these waves 
here's us in the boat. And so this was because of the earthquake. So it wasn't a, like a huge tsunami, but the seas were extremely rough because of um, this earthquake. And it was a little bit scary. So, but we made it. And then of course, this is exactly what the port in Santa Cruz looked like. So as soon as we got to Santa Cruz, I mean, the it was very calm. So that was kind of open, um, open seas were very rough. And then when you get kind of more protected at the islands, um, it was beautiful. And so this is a little hike we went. I don't know where other people went, but this is, um, I do not speak Spanish, Las Grietas. Um, it's called, it's known as the cracks. And it's a really cool crack um, in the rocks that has collected. So it's brackish water. So there's, there's um, uh, fresh water coming in from inland. And then there is a little bit of salt water coming from um, from the ocean. So it's brackish water, but it's, it's a very, very popular, very, very clear um, swimming hole, really. And so these are the only decent underwater pictures that I got. And this one fish, which apparently, oh, you know, in the crack, there's not a, there's not a lot of like animals at the bottom, like you don't have to worry about it. And then I'm like, well, what about this huge fish that I just found? That's creepy looking, but it's fine. A uh, couple more endemic species. So the Galapagos flycatcher, again, fairly easy to identify because there's so few um, species out there. These guys were kind of all over the place, Galapagos mockingbird. So it, it and they are fun to listen to. If for anybody that is, um, is a birder, again, very similar uh, uh, shape to the mockingbirds we have around here, um, but endemic, unique. And then the one Galapagos finch that I knew for sure we had right was a cactus finch. Um, so the cactus finch has a fairly unique, very sharp curved beak and it eats very specific things. So our guide um, said with surety that this was a cactus finch. Um, and the males are these black or jet black and the females um, are more streaky and brown colored. Um, and that is another thing that a lot of them have in common. So like the ground finches and cactus finch, all the males are black and all the females are the same. So there's, it's not like, oh, well that one has a bright red patch on its wing. So we know what it is. It's um, it, a lot of them are very similar color. There's not a lot of bright colors, so it's interesting. Um, traveling to San Cristobal, I've got common noddies. This was a new species for me. These are not endemic. You can see these other places, but they're really cool to watch, um, kind of dive down into the water and come out and um, aerial flyers. They're really cool. So from Santa Cruz, San Cristobal, I was, so this, island in the very corner down here, Española, um, there is a species of albatross that nests on that island. And I desperately, the whole time I was looking for an albatross flying around, I never saw one. I tried to make a booby into an albatross, but that is very hard to do because albatross are very, very large. So I was like, can we just like take a, just a spin around, but, um, the, these make the distances look very short, but it's not, it's not that short. So San Cristobal has um, a, a lot of shops. It's very touristy. And I don't know if anybody saw, I'm wearing my Galapagos shirt right now that I bought out on the island. Um, and that was my, my big touristy thing, other than the thing I was talking to Alana about earlier, which I'll tell you about in a bit. Um, the Galapagos sea lion. These were everywhere. And I sped up this video. <laughs> I sped up this video. They were, I don't know about other people's experiences there, but they own these islands. They own it. They own it. 
This is one of the kids on our trip. <laughs> and they, they get on these benches and they are disgusting. They stink. They smell so bad. So the kids were so funny. They, they just wanted to be around these sea lions the whole time. So they would get into this gazebo and the sea lions would be on the other benches and they would just be hanging out with them. And it smelled so bad, um, but it was cute to see them kind of interact um, with, uh, with these animals, but they were everywhere. They just, they were bosses. They did not care. If you were in the place where they, they just are not afraid. Um, so we went, we did go to a beach. We did go um, snorkeling. I don't want to talk too much about the snorkeling. Just to say that I am not good at snorkeling. I have a very hard time. I don't know about anybody else. I've talked to other people that it's just, it's just not my sport, I would say. Um, so I have a very hard time with the breathing and the coordination. So everybody else saw a sea turtle, but me is the end of that story. So it was, it was a little bit sad, but um, I had a good time on the beach hanging out with the Galapagos hermit crab. So again, endemic species, um, probably most of you have seen hermit crabs before, but these little guys are everywhere cruising around. Again, unique to these islands. The lava heron, which again is another endemic. So that was really exciting. Um, and they have, again, they have other herons. I saw a great blue heron while I was out there. Um, I believe they have um, maybe even a, a couple other herons that are kind of similar shape to the lava heron, um, like a green heron maybe they have out there. They have night herons. Um, my first yellow crowned night heron was seen out on these islands. Um, but the lava heron is the only one that is endemic to these islands. Um, it was really neat. And here's just the beach at sunset. It was really incredible. So again, spending time on the equator, all the days, it's basically the same length all the time. And uh, so it was um, about 12 hours of daylight. So here's me not completely covered. I kept my sun hat, but in order to go snorkeling, you do have to take your pants off. So there was a short amount of time. Plus the sun was setting. I felt like it wasn't quite as bad, um, but somebody snapped this picture of me with a, a marine iguana, which was really neat. Um, here it is on the beach. So see all these lines? all these lines and these little specks, they just cruise around. So again, just kind of like the sea lions, they're just the bosses of the beach. I mean, they, they are not afraid. They're not afraid you could get really close to them. Um, and look at that tail. So they are swimmers. This is a terrible picture. Again, snorkeling, not my thing, kind of freaking out. But I did get a picture of Godzilla, baby Godzilla. Uh, swimming right next to me, which was really neat. They have this long, long tail that they use for swimming. It's, it's really, um, really amazing animal. And they are so prehistoric looking. Um, it's really incredible. And they're kind of covered in salt all the time, which is cool. So leaving the Galapagos. See, I am making really good time. So here's some brown pelicans that were hanging out at the um, on San Cristobal when we were leaving. So uh, Baltra Island, which is where we flew into, has an airport, but um, San Cristobal also has an airport. So we actually left from there. We didn't have to go back. Um, and so we went back. Here was um, right before we left. I got this video of again the Sally Lightfoot crabs. And my favorite touristy thing, anybody that was listening to Alana and I before the presentation started knows what this is. Can anybody tell me what this little thing is? This little disc. Maybe it'll have to be Alana. 
and just in the chat. Nobody? Nobody? It's a souvenir penny. It's a souvenir penny. So um, one of the shops, first of all, there's a website where you can go to see where all of the press penny machines are in the entire world. Um, so I did that before I went on this trip and found out that there was one on one of the islands and it was, we only went to three islands, um, but it was one of the ones that we were going to. And so I walked up and down the, um, the shops along this, um, this waterfront and I went into this place and I was like, do you have a, this pressed penny machine? And, and it was kind of hiding in a corner. It wasn't displayed or anything. And um, so I got my pressed penny and uh, it's just, a, I just love it. I think it's a really fun way to get a souvenir and to remember um, to remember a place. So I don't know if anybody else collects press pennies, but I think they're awesome. And just a, these are the birds that I saw on these days. And I did this just one day, one day, two, day three, day four out on the island. And then my last day in Ecuador, I went birding on mainland Ecuador. I hired a bird guide and he brought me around um, for a half day of birding on mainland Ecuador. And these are the birds that we saw on that half day, four hours of birding. This is what we saw on the last day of my trip. So that was really amazing. And um, I then the next year went back and did a full trip on mainland Ecuador. And then two years later, I went back and did a longer tour just on mainland Ecuador. And that's the, um, I did do a presentation on those trips um, a few weeks ago. And this was, this is part of it. So if anybody is a bird watcher or a birder and looking for a trip, I would say Ecuador is, is way up there. And most tour companies that operate out of Ecuador offer um, Galapagos as part of the trip. So you can design it to have that and maybe stay on a yacht. I'm not sure. Um, that's my whole thing. Look at that. Only 50 minutes. So if anybody has any questions, I, uh, when my dog started barking, I made her go outside and then I, <clears throat> she's just been sitting out there the whole time. Um, well, I don't have a question, but this is Steve and Dorothy was the other person who's my wife texting yeah. back with, uh, or on this on the chat. We went in 2016, as I said in the chat, and uh, it was the most amazing trip I think we've ever had. Uh, you know, we went on a National Ge Geographic boat, 100 foot, 100 passenger boat. So it stopped at various places. And I'll just share a couple vignettes of things. One was we were on this big wide open beach and if you imagine a beach like a mile long we were 200 yards from anybody dorothy's sitting on the sand and this um animal what was it dorothy are you on, on mute it was a the, it was the, a sea lion i was sitting up on the shore, shore. I, I, I was remember. drawing staying out of the water and trying to hide from the sun much like i imagine you were a lot of the time mary so i was way up on the kind of on the where the beach where the sand turned into whatever kind of scruffy uh, growth there was. I think that's what he's talking about. Go ahead. Yeah. And the sea lion just walked out in the middle of nowhere and sat right down about three feet from her. <laughs> yeah. You're not, you're not afraid of anything. Yeah. I don't think he could even see me, <laughs> honestly. It was incredible. And uh, yeah. so we, one of the guides told us that the reason that the animals, don't, I mean, they don't have any fear of humans because there was mm. really no predation there at all. No, there's no been humans decimating populations and things there. The only thing that happened is all the seafarers took the um, took the the, uh, the sea lions, I think is, is what. The tortoises you're talking the about. The tor tortoises, tortoises, yeah. yeah. And yeah. so the tortoises were a little shy, but nobody else was. Yeah. And the biomass there is incredible. I mean, the and number, when you see something like your Sally Lightfoot crabs, we saw a wall of Sally Lightfoot crabs that had thousands and thousands and thousands of them there. I mean, yeah. it was 
It was remarkable. Yeah. 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 And they're so striking. Yeah. You have the, all these drab finches and yeah. then suddenly this bright red yeah. crab. Like, is that already cooked? Like what's happening right now? <laughs> yeah. It was, it was incredible. Yeah. 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 It, was, it, it was an amazing trip. I'm not, it, maybe if I had an opportunity to, to, um, to go more places and to be a little bit more independent, I think I would go back. Um, yeah. But that was, it was an incredible opportunity and probably one um, just financially, we don't have to get into all the finances, but um, financially I would, I would not have been able to do that trip by myself yeah. um, without yeah. that opportunity through the school. Yeah. So. I, would, I would say one more thing for me anyway, I read the Voyage of the Beagle on the way down. And then when we got there, we went to places where he had stood and looked out into these uh, craters. And I mean, it was, you could almost feel Darwin there. And to see the, the limited number of uh, vertebrates around. So it made it so easy, it made everything crystallized for him. It was just, it was a thrill. It was a, it was, it was a great, I would, yeah. If you can get there. It, and there, yeah. there, the reason there are no mammals or very few of them is because the only way you get a mammal on the island is to float on a piece of tree debris for three and a half weeks or four weeks on the ocean open and they die. So they don't ever make it there. Yeah. So it's yeah. amazing. It is, it is amazing. And it's, it's amazing to see what, what has evolved there. Um, but yeah, the historic, the weight of that kind of historic, um, those are historic events and, and what came out of it and, and Darwin's experiences there and just how much science has evolved from his observations. It is, it is really, it is really incredible. It was, that was one of the things, the hard things about being there with them. Um, and it wasn't all of those kids. So some of them were, were a little bit more serious about it, but some of them, it, it really, they were there to, to like lay on the beach. And I was like, you're gonna pay thousands of dollars to just come and lay on the, it was incredible. Um, I was the only one. So this is the guide that I got, um, which is like 160 pages for birds, mammals, and reptiles. Yeah, almost nothing, yeah. It's almost nothing, but I was the only one that had a guide. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> I was the only one that had like kind of a proper camera. Um, and it was, and binoculars and, and it was, um, it was just very interesting. So yeah, if I had an opportunity, I think to do it with, um, with a more serious group, I mean, our guides were, you know, they were conservationists, they worked for the national park. Um, they were very serious and I think they were grateful to have somebody there that was like, what's that? Yeah. <laughs> what are those birds? What, yeah. what's going on here? Tell me more about this. So, cause yeah. the kids were like, okay where's the beach <laughs> where's the beach and getting sun poisoning so yeah um oh so and also i showed alana before we started this is my my souvenir penny passport and these are my souvenir pennies um i actually got four on the galapagos so you can get different patterns and i got all four sometimes i don't do all of them because i think well i'll come back to this place and then i'll get the next one i'll get the next um uh pattern but i don't think that's gonna necessarily happen so i got all four and um does anybody else collect pennies like that's a really it's a really it's a really fun thing thank you dorothy yes um so if if people don't have any other questions I actually finished up pretty much on time. Anybody that um, did go to the the Ecuador one, it was it was a little bit it was a little bit long. But again, it's so so rich. The Galapagos is rich in history, um, and yeah, going to the Charles Darwin Center was also quite quite an experience. And seeing some of those species, I didn't see the flightless cormorants, which was a little disappointing, but. Um, but that's okay. Uh, uh, that's Mary, a lot of really neat stuff. Elliot? Stanley. Yeah. Uh, I think that, uh, well, first of all, it was an excellent talk and we greatly enjoyed it. 
Uh, I have seen, I think the Sierra Club is one of the organizations that is discouraging tourism to the Galapagos. Mm -hmm. And I've read that in various publications, that the fear that too many people are going down there. And I think in one or two cases, we have uh, mentioned it to friends of ours who said, oh, we're going to go take a trip to the Galapagos. Uh, and I, I was thinking about the fact that there is a concern about over tourism. Do you have a thought on that subject? Well, I do have all kinds of thoughts. Well, um, and I had heard that as well. And, and some people were saying uh, that they're going to start cutting off tourism to the islands. And again, I going through the school, I wasn't privy to like the permits or permissions that we had to get to go to the islands. I know you can't just like bop there in your yacht without um, without permission, I believe. Uh, so there is some control, but it is a very real concern and it is such a special unique place that already has been ravaged by invasive species. You know, I, I was like, oh, roses, flat, you know, there were roses blooming. I was like, oh, look at these roses. And they're like, nope, that's an invasive species. Like so much of the flora and fauna there um, is invasive. Also that wasp that nailed me um, is not a native species. So that all of, I mean, for the most, yeah, for the most part, all of those species are there is because of humans. Um, you know, that wasp didn't just like cruise 800 miles to get there by itself, it went on a ship. So um, that invasive species is a big deal. Inva I mean, we actually, one of the kids accidentally had an apple in their backpack from the flight and they searched all of his luggage, everything. They, right on the dock, they took everything out um, because, you know, and apple, apple seeds get out, they grow, they spread. That's an invasive species. So they, they take it very, that part they take very seriously, but it's also, it's, it's revenue. So it's, a, it's hard. It's a hard um, balance. But I, I definitely agree with strongly limiting and I don't know, maybe having to write an essay <laughs> why you wanna to go to the Galapagos because none of those kids would have made it in, but I would have. <laughs> like have some kind of, um, you know, not just sit on the beach because you can sit on the beach in, in Florida and have the same experience. So um, I certainly wanna see it protected and, um, and there are organizations that do that, that we can donate to, um, which is good. But, and the breeding centers are great. Um, some of the conservation efforts, replanting of native species and, and controlling invasives, all of those are great, but reducing the number of people that step foot on those islands, I think is um, an, important, an important thing. And I don't, I'm not up on it, but I think they've been saying, well, I've been back for five years. So it's been five years and five years ago, people were talking about limiting tourism. Um, well, my, my comment on that is that National Geographic obviously is environmentally careful, uh, but they, they were telling us that they were expressing the same concerns. And at least for the bigger tour operators, which I assume are things like Road Scholar and, and National Geographic, they have a schedule that they can only go a certain number of times and they, they can't go to any beach. They have to schedule it and it's all sort of organized to be environmentally at least non too terrible, I guess. Not it. too terrible, yeah. But, oh, but there's a lot of these small boats that we looked at were like 12 people, catamarans, kind of like the one you, you showed us in the picture. And now how they control them from going everywhere, you know, haphazardly is another thing. So I don't, I don't know how it works exactly, but you know, they're conscious of it and the bigger tour groups are, are trying to be at least helpful. Yeah. 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 I think they're mindful and, and really, and the locals, um, even though it's a revenue stream, they also very much 
care about their islands. Um, so there's a lot of conservation efforts going on, a lot of organizations and foundations working there to protect it. But I mean, the bottom line is if you have too many people, you have too many people. So um, yeah. So I wouldn't be surprised if, I, if, if they shut it down, even just for a time, you know, let, let things regrow, let things um, have a breather just to tourism. I mean, there's people that live there. You can't just be like, yeah, I'm wondering what you have to move, you know, people live there um, all the time and have businesses, but most of a lot of the businesses are, are tourism related. So I'm wondering if the, the pandemic, it's been pretty much shut down for a year anyway. Yeah. yeah. Maybe that's having a, a positive impact. I know just looking at and communicating with some of the tour operators that I worked with when I was in Ecuador, um, they opened up to, I'm not going to say everybody but Americans, but they, they opened up um, inter, like inside Ecuador travel um, pretty early on. Like they had, they were allowing people to travel within Ecuador and go on vacations and, and do things. So I'm not sure um, about going to the islands, but you get you get something like COVID on an island and that could be really um, devastating. But um, so hopefully they're doing okay, but I don't know. That was five years ago. I feel like that was pretty good for not, <laughs> pretty good memory for my, my mo, you know, the, the clearest memories for me are seeing the Galapagos hawk and see like identifying the the mockingbird and and seeing those very unique species and just getting and the flamingo i'd never seen a flamingo before and just those those kinds of moments um and just being really odd um seeing some of those especially the endemic species so well thanks again yeah, thank you for coming. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna shut down. If people don't have any other questions, I'm gonna shut out and go have a little late dinner. Thank you so much. Me too. Thanks, Mary. Very nice. Thank you. Have bye. A wonderful night. Thanks. Bye. Mm -hmm.